Hey, what's going on, everyone? Um, my name is Rob Edward, and I wanted to provide a little intro for my podcast that I just started. Um, I just recorded the first episode last night uh, with a good friend of mine, Tom Barnett. Um, and I just wanted to touch base with everyone before we get into that and just explain why I'm doing this and, and why I decided to kind of um, take this leap uh, at the moment that I'm doing. And um, just give a bit of background to myself and um, yeah, uh, basically, I spent my entire life dedicated and obsessed with the arts and entertainment industry. Uh, you know, I love movies and storytelling, and I wanted to be trained to go after my dream and, and become who I wanted to become and pursue my passion and what I thought was my purpose. Um, so I, I auditioned for and was accepted into one of the best drama schools in the UK, Rose Bruford College, and I dedicated my life to be the best. Um, I showed up early, I wrote plays and movies and, and everything I possibly could. And I did everything that I could do to inspire those around me. And I leaned on people, you know, and, and I felt the, um, the love and connection um, truly when I started to go after what I wanted to do. And um, I can't thank those people enough. You know who you are if you're watching this. Um, I, I cannot express my gratitude to you guys enough. Um, you know, and but leading up to this, I was terribly shy and I never mentioned my love or my dream or my passion to anyone all through my adolescence and high school um, because I was terrified to expose this vulnerable side of myself to, to others, um, to admit what I really wanted and what, my, what was my dream and my passion. Um, and it was out of fear of what other, others might think. It was only after all my friends went away from school and all that kind of stuff that I allow myself to pursue what I wanted. So, you know, I did what others tell you to do that most don't do until they have a crisis or they, you know, their backs up against a wall or something. But I pursued my dream and my passion first, and I didn't take any easy or safe route. So upon leaving my training, I started to see this sort of dark underbelly of the entertainment industry. Um, I think we're all seeing now what's kind of coming out of that. And I sort of became aware of that as I was leaving and you know, people were getting exposed and we were seeing how toxic and how kind of how difficult that entertainment industry is to either break into or what you would have to do to truly become, you know, noticed in that. And I basically, I was basically led to a paralyzing and an extremely terrifying thought, which was what now? You know, people always tell you to pursue your dreams, pursue your passion and do what makes you happy. And it's just no matter how many self-help books I read and podcasts and interviews and inspirational things, it all said the same thing or had the same story, which was, you know, um, I always wanted to play guitar. I always wanted to be a painter or an artist or a musician or whatever. Um, but my parents always wanted to be uh, a lawyer or a doctor or a banker or something like that. And, you know, now that I'm, you know, successful and all that kind of stuff, I threw it all away and I'm so happy um, that I'm aligned back with my passion. But what if you pursue your passion first and it confronts you with the fact that you're going to have to give up everything that you are and everything that you care about to pursue your dream? What if your passion is the thing of which you have to change? How do you go, how do you find what is actually driving you? What's in your soul to become expressed as an alignment to what you want to do? What if you're like me and what I thought was my passion would force me to sacrifice my soul and everything it means to be human? How do you find alignment if what you're aligned with crumbles? And I realized my passion wasn't actually about acting or creating art per se, what I loved was com emotional connection. I felt when completely immersed in a story, I, I loved it so much. I, I thought I needed to be the one who had that effect on others. What I didn't realize was that it was my unmet needs through my life, which made me feel like I was, that was the only way that I could be loved. I didn't think that anybody can truly see me or, or love me for who I truly was. So the best way was to try and get everyone to love me you know, and put me right in their face and say, here, yeah, here I am. I, you know, you can't ignore me. But do you see how that it, in itself was still the escapism? Acting by definition is trying to become or hide behind a character to elicit an emotional response in an audience. No matter how good, how famous, how much potential money I would make, I would have still felt that, that emptiness. 
It was through digging within myself that I was able to find the answers. My love and purpose was always about human connection, you know, truly trying to see someone who they are and provide value and solutions to their situation to help them not feel small or insignificant or powerless and to provide a service to them so they could feel empowered and strong and capable to contend with their life and have the courage and strength to pursue what they want. And through the past two years with everything going on in, in, in the world right now, I really started to hone in on what it actually was. And that's when I found and I started to train with Paul Check at the Paul Check Institute. And I became a holistic lifestyle coach and holistic health practitioner. You know, I wanted to study with the absolute best who has the best system for mind, body, and spirit connection and have the tools to be able to help people in all areas of their life and align their mental, emotional, physical, and spiritual life to help people pursue their passion and dreams and goals. So if you're looking from my experience, it was personal. It was unique, but all of ours are unique. I spent years trying to figure out how to go back to entering, you know, the more safe jobs. You know, I worked at banking. I worked at a loan office. Um, I worked at sign shops and printing shops and did construction and concrete and all of these different jobs to try to find what it was. But the problem that I had was I pursued my action first, my passion first. The fact that it wasn't fully aligned with my purpose was not really the relevant part. The point is that I pursued a dream and came face to face with confronting the fact that the dream would sacrifice my soul. And I spent years searching, reading, researching everything that could help me uncover what I was not seeing. No matter how hard I looked, I was never able to find the answer because no one but me knew it. So that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. Because I can help people dig within themselves to find their purpose, their inner calling. And the training is from the best in the world. Whether that be my personal study, the people that I'm going to bring to you on this podcast to speak about these things personally so that I can help you and bring tools and solutions if you're struggling with the same things that I did. Or, you know, me getting the certification that I did from the best damn person on the planet on holistic health with Paul Check and the Check Institute. So if my story resonates with you, I'd love to hear from you. I truly believe the highest purpose is service to others. And I would love to speak with you about what you're struggling with. And we can work together to create a path towards alignment. So that's it. I don't want to take up too much more time, but um, this is why I'm doing what I'm doing. And I'm going to try my absolute best to bring the best people on the planet with knowledge and tools and solution on alternative health, um, mindset, goals, everything that I can, that's going to help people live more fulfilled lives. And I can't be more happy to, um, to have my first guest here, Tom Barnett. He's great, great person offering tons of solutions. You can find him at tombarnett.tv. And um, he's a great guy. I consider him a friend and I'm so excited uh, to speak with him and to show him uh, and everything that he does to you guys too. So please enjoy. And if you do enjoy, let me know and uh, reach out and uh, maybe we can work together sometime. All right. Welcome. What's going on? This is uh, Dig Within. My name is Rob Edward. Uh, this is the first episode. I'm, uh, I'm stoked to have my first, uh, my first guest on here. Uh, he's been kind of a mentor to me and I'm sure to a lot of people uh, all over the world at the moment um, with everything going on, offering a voice of uh, clarity, uh, offering solutions, which is why I really wanted to kind of have him on here and kind of go through um, you know, his journey and uh, what brought him here today. So uh, yeah, let's bring him in here. Tom, how's it going, man? Yeah, real good. Thanks, Rob. Really happy actually to be your first guest. Pretty exciting. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, uh, it's nice to have such a gentleman as my first. Um, yeah, I was just wondering, uh, basically, I don't really care too much about what people went to school and like what their qualifications are and all that kind of stuff. I just, I'm more like, you know, picking up on the people who are genuine and if they have actual, you know, um, genuine knowledge to share and like their, their story is kind of, you know, strikes a chord with people and really kind of, uh, you know, um, means something to someone. And, um, I've heard your story a million times, man, but, uh, if you wouldn't mind just kind of diving into, you know, what drove you to really take control of your health in, you know, a very sort of personal accountability and responsibility way. And, 
maybe just kind of how that has really affected your life kind of in, in terms of health, but also, you know, in your, your life as a, as a whole. For sure. Well, I mean, I did go to school as far as that goes, you know, when you talk about qualifications, but it's just, it wasn't for me. It was not a harmonious environment that I really thought led the way to critical thinking. For me, it was all about if you didn't fit a specific mold, it wasn't the right thing. And the mold to me was wrong. So, but going back, you know, when I was young, I was, uh, you know, my parents raised me to be academic, not just academic. I mean, I got into tennis early, um, but they just encouraged my learning, which was really good. So I, you know, I used to have the times table stuck on my bedroom door and, uh, I could do that and read and write before other kids at the school I went to. And so I, they thought I was really bright and everything. They wanted to move me up classes and stuff. But uh, it was really just because my parents took an active interest in uh, helping me learn when I was young. And so uh, I loved school. I really did. And I went to a private school. I got moved from a public to a private school in grade five. So I was probably uh, like nine, 10 years old and really loved school. I loved it there. And then we moved up a, state, a couple of states. And uh, as soon as I got into that kind of teens, that early 12, 13, <laughs> started going off the rails a bit, went to another different school. I'd moved schools a couple of times by now. And uh, I was finding that the doing well at academics was not really the cool thing. Like some kids go, oh, wow, how do you know what a Bunsen burner is? Because I could name the stuff in science class. And I was thinking, well, because... At my last school, we learned that like three years ago. But it's really just naming stuff. But that's not that's not intelligence, you know. That's just that's called a Bunsen burner. It doesn't mean you can use it. It doesn't mean you know how to do experiments with it. it. Doesn't mean anything. It just means you can label it. And already at that point, around fourteen years of age, I was thinking, this isn't really like that's not smart. Just being able to label something. That's people are kind of. I think they're idolizing the wrong kind of thing. So I started to throw that away and become more cool <laughs> and do just do whatever people thought was funny and, uh, and also, you know, rub the teachers the wrong way a little and uh, do what I thought was right. And I'd, by the time I was about 15, 16, I'd gone back to another better private school and I'd figured out the school. I figured out that they were using us as marketing agents for future students for future you know to look good in the eyes of society and I was thinking from a business point of view I get it they've got to do that like I get it but at the same time it wasn't really students and educational learning first it was more about a concept or a construct of the mind about what this school is what the education is and what the kids are all about and I was thinking this just doesn't sit well with me at all so I, I got the lowest grades possible that I could get to get into the college course that I wanted to get into. Not because I really wanted to go to college, but because you just do that after school. Like what else do you do? You go do a trade or you go to college pretty much. So I went to college and I did uh, sports science because I was good at science and math and I like sports. So I just thought, let's do sports science. And, <laughs> and this was also where I knew, I was already figuring this out, Rob, which is, People think you have to get a certain score in school to get into medicine or physiotherapy or something where you need a high score. And I was like, but I, I don't think that's right because I think you can get into science and do a year of that. And then you can just switch up your courses and that's exactly what you could do. And within university, it was more of the same. It was just people not liking questions and not really wanting you to move outside of the syllabus. And I was thinking, this is not what learning is. This is not, at least it's not how I learn. And it was more about repetition and rote learning and being able to spit out something that you had heard or read in a book. That was it. There was no critical thinking. It was just, that was it. So I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad when I was 20 or 21. And that gave me, I was like, wow, there is another way. So then I thought, I don't have to continue with this uh, college stuff. I can just go and work and start a business. So one of the elements, the reason I've gone to here is that one of the elements that was there when I was young was that I got approval and validation and love and attention by being good at something such as acad academics or I was good at sport as well, right? And then so what happens is when you don't have a very good relationship with yourself and your parents and it's all based on your achievements, well, that leads you really far out of balance. So from that point, from a young age, I didn't realize this till I was 30 something, 
that part of me was always driving to to do something but then there was a a rift there when I realized that what I was being driven to do was something that was not right it didn't fit me I didn't fit the system and so then as I quit college and went into athletics and went into running a business and working full time I really burnt myself out because I just was not in balance at all so that was it that was me losing my health losing all the stuff that I'd worked towards and then all of the doctors scientists uh, you know, professors that I had been involved with for the last, you know, 10 or so years, they didn't have any answers and all the medical texts that I was studying didn't have any answers. And I was like, okay, well, this whole system is just, it's just not there. It's just not, it doesn't really provide in the real world. So then I went into the natural therapies world and found more or less the same results, to be honest. And then I found Paul Check's work. And Paul then put me on to people like Rudolf Steiner and Anton Basham. And then looking into all this stuff I'd never heard about before, you know, like germs, germs aren't the cause of disease. What the hell? <laughs> and then, and going into what it means to be balanced, realizing that there is a physical, mental, emotional, and a spiritual body, and they all combine. So if you're out of balance with your emotions, or you don't have a solid connection to what put you here, or even realize what that is, well, then you're going to have a difficult time. And that's what I was experiencing. So at that point, I realized, well, it took a few more years, but I realized that all of the responsibility then was not in my coaches that I thought had helped to make me sick. It wasn't in my parents who I thought had done the wrong thing. And it wasn't in the doctors that I thought were doing the wrong thing as well. I was always blaming, like I was a victim of everything. So then once I'd switched it around and it was just, this is all about me and I'm taking responsibility for this. It is, I've created it myself. And so it's my responsibility now to become balanced, to get all those bodies in balance. And then that began that journey back to regaining some health and having a more, uh, a more focused life that's based not on what others expect, or on achieving validation, attention, love, attention, or any of that, but in something that's uh, internally fulfilling. So that's been the last 15 or so years. Right. Yeah. 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 Now I know uh, just because I, I've followed your work for, you know, the past like year and a half and um, I've talked to you kind of off camera as well. Um, but what sort of, what was the culmination of you meeting the pain teacher for the first time? Because you've obviously uh, you've um, turned me on to Paul Check's work and I've since been, studying his system for the past year now. And that's why I'm kind of uh, doing what I'm doing right here right now um, is to offer, um, you know, you know, I would consider very educated people and knowing what actually is the root cause of disease and health and bringing that to the forefront for people so that we can kind of come to some sort of um, hopefully new paradigm of actually, you know, healing and actually being fulfilled in our lives. And I know a huge thing with, with Paul's work too is, you know, understanding that everything that happens to you is for a reason. And if you do become, you know, misaligned in some way uh, with, with health and with kind of like, you know, what he calls the pain teacher, um, usually it's either you learn from that or you run from it. And what was it, what was a pain teacher for you um, when, when I kind of brought you into this new world and what, what kind of went off in your mind where you said, I want to go into this as opposed to run from it. I think I was running from it for a long time. And that was really why I got into athletics so heavily was that I was running from this internal uh, disconnection that I had. And a lot of athletes actually are the same once you, once you start doing some counseling with them and they don't realize why they're fighting or sprinting or swimming or doing like jumping off cliffs with parachutes on their back. They don't realize why they're doing it, but they're trying to escape something. And uh, I mean, I had a great time doing that. And a lot of athletes love what they do. There's nothing wrong with it. But sometimes getting an idea of why we're driven to do certain things is very helpful. And so I was always running from the pain teacher. And then it just got to a stage where I couldn't run anymore because the pain teacher just wouldn't let me go. It caught up with me, caused me a lot of physical pain and then also a lot of uh, emotional, uh, yeah, emotional mental pain, I would say as well, because I no longer could do the things that I was doing that gave me a sense of self. And I think that's a real gift because when you're stripped of the things that you think you are, you think you're an athlete, you think you've got a great memory or intellect, you've got a great 
uh, creativity streak or something and you lose those things, then you realize that you're not those things. You're not that. You're actually something eternal and bigger and more than that. And, and so that's a real gift, you know, but it took a lot of pain to, to get there. So what the pain teacher essentially taught me all when I decided to go into it was when I was cornered. I actually didn't have an option anymore. <laughs> and what, what was that for you? What was that cornering? That was like very heavy chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, um, just really your body not functioning, organs pretty much just shutting down, like zero energy, zero life force, zero uh, ability to do anything. Like I've always been very, a constitution that's very motivated and uh, likes to work and likes to move. And then just actually that being completely depleted to the point where I can barely walk up a flight of stairs, uh, a depressed and not because I'm mentally depressed, but it's just a, the system itself. My whole being is just in a suppressed and a depressed state. And then just, yeah, just not knowing what to do, not knowing who I, how I was ever going to function, uh, how I was going to regain health or anything for that matter, losing all the money that I'd saved, uh, being homeless because I couldn't go live with my parents or anything like that. And so, uh, yeah, that was it. That was just kind of being cornered. I just couldn't, I physically couldn't do anything about it mentally i could i was trying to find ways and then also with that it opened me up more to things that i'd experienced when i was younger around 12 which was more of the astral traveling which i didn't know what that was mm. but when you that suppressed there's a level of disassociation that can occur especially from the pain and then that leads to uh, bodies separating such as the astral body and then having other experiences where you start going, well, there's more to life than this, which again, through the pain you get taught if you're open to it. And I guess one of your questions that I haven't directly answered is at what point did I, I choose it? I mean, like I said, it's when I was cornered, but when I started to want to go with it, as opposed to against it, just thinking, oh, well, I'll be better in the next month. I'll be running again in two weeks or, you know what I mean? That's what I was like for years. I'll be back in the gym in a month. It'll be fine. <laughs> so then I actively chose to explore that side of things where I was having lots of visions and I would actively explore the vision. So my physical body was pretty much useless, but I could actively explore these alternate realities that I was experiencing, such as for the first time feeling a uh, a respiration of the entire earth plane i was just i could feel it i was like it's, you know those things that just floor you you just feel something you go whoa and your mind just stops for a second you just go oh that's that's like amazing yeah and being able to feel things with my hands that i couldn't feel before uh, many different things but that was the choice for me rob that was it when i just thought i want to follow that now i'm letting the pain teacher show me I've got no choice now, but that is the thing I'm actively going to follow. Right. Yeah. And I became noticed, uh, you know, I became aware of your work uh, through of our video that you did, um, obviously called, um, you know, can you catch a virus or why you can't catch a virus? Um, mm -hmm. I, believe, I forget which title it's called, but um, maybe we can just kind of clear that up because I, I feel like that's kind of um, related to your pain teacher and kind of how you yeah. um, how you were confronted and cornered as well. Um, so, yeah, I mean, can you catch a virus? No, you can't catch him. <laughs> I think the video was called, can you catch a virus? That's what it was yeah. called. Cause I wanted to put it as a question. I, I prefer questions rather than just make an outright statement when you're trying to just offer something to people. But, um, when I was in my early to mid twenties, I was sick constantly. Like I was getting, this is when I was, you know, I'd gone to that point where I just <laughs> dropped right out. And I was getting 13 colds in one year at one point. That's more than once a month. I got a cold or a, a flu. I think there were more colds than flus. But um, I mean, that's a lot. That's highly immunosuppressed, right? So I was also getting viral activity. I'd get cold sores. I'd have, I'd be knocked out for a week or two where I like, couldn't get out of bed. So viral activity. And uh, around this time, I was experimenting a lot with antivirals and everything that you could do to knock out a virus, right? Chasing a virus, it's going to my liver, it's going to my kidneys, it's a, whatever you think is going on. And I was following that, that allopathic and also the natural allopathic mindset of what's going on in the body, but nothing was helping. I'm like surely me punching like 50 of these coenzyme Q10 tablets that are costing me an arm and a leg, that'll get me better. 
but nothing ever brought the energy in. Nothing ever suppressed or nothing ever healed the, uh, the conditions, right? So I still, it got me thinking, I'm like, well, what's suppressing me? Like, why am I getting this? What's really going on? And then through, it was actually through Paul's work, but I've never heard it through Paul directly. I've never heard him talk about germ theory in this way because, I mean, I love the guy, but he, when he talks about fungal and parasite infections, he does talk about them as invasive organisms that need to be, you know, you go on fungal cleanses and parasite cleanses through his work. And I did a lot of those, and and uh, but, but there's more to it than that. So just out of through going through some of Rudolf Steiner's work and then Antoine Beauchamp, I'm like, who's this dude? So then through Steiner and Beauchamp, I started looking into the idea. They're like, germs are not the cause of disease. A weakened toxic internal environment is the cause of having germs. And that's the cause of dis-ease, the weakened toxic internal environment. And I was thinking, that's not what I learned through science and medicine when I was studying that. And so I've got to explore this. I started reading into it and it made sense, but I'm one of those people that I can't just take something that makes sense in a book and go, well, that's it. Because I was rebelling against that uh, particular paradigm because of what I went through in school and college, which was you learn something, you parrot it back, you get a certificate and then you're competent and you go out in the world and you get a mortgage and you, and all that sort of stuff. And I was like, that's just not how, that's not right. So I thought it makes sense. I'm reading it. I'm like, that just makes total sense. It's really resonating with me, but I can't just take their word for it out of a book. And being really sick at the time, I thought I've got nothing to lose. It's like, I'm going to try this. You know, I'm going to get myself a virus. I'll see if I can you know, do that. So I exposed myself to mucus, blood, sexual fluids. Uh, what else is there? Sweat from people who had active viral infections. And despite being immunosuppressed at the time and prone to multiple viral infections in a year, I couldn't infect myself from these people. I just couldn't do it. And I thought, that's really weird. Like if anyone should be able to catch a virus, it's me. 13 colds in a year, immunosuppressed, can barely like walk up a flight of stairs. I should be able to catch a virus. And I couldn't do it. And that was it for me. I was solid. I thought, well, that's it. It's, it's my body. My body is creating these as a response to some sort of stimulus. And, uh, and so that was, that changed and didn't change my, it wasn't like a mind thing. It was an embodiment. So that's it. I just know it now. That's uh, it's in my body. And it, it gave me a great faith in everything. Like the way everything's designed. I was like, that just makes so much sense. Why would we be just prone to uh, random infection from any, it just doesn't make sense. You know, we should, that doesn't, that's a fearful and a, uh, uh, that's it's not a nice way to go through life thinking that you know comets can come and destroy you and viruses can come and destroy you and dinosaurs might come back if they isolate their dna and they'll eat you and like that's just mental so that gave me a lot of faith in nature itself like a greater degree of connection to nature and feeling like when i was homeless and i'd go i'd wrap myself in uh, palm leaves and that and sleep dig a hole in the sand and sleep in the beach i was like I'm safe if, na if nature will look after me. And I just had that. It just deepened and deepened through those experiences, which some would call the pain teacher. But for me, those experiences weren't painful. They were quite joyful in, in being able to experience those. And so when it comes down to that whole germs thing and can you catch viruses, that turned me into a full faith in nature, but a full faith in and responsibility in myself where it's me. If I look after what's going through between these ears up here and I watch what's going in, the stimulus that I'm receiving, newspapers, TV, social media, all that sort of stuff, the people I hang around and the food that I bring into my body, how do I nourish myself? Not only physical food, but soul food. If I look after that, I won't get viruses. And, and you know, that's been the case, except for one circumstance, which is important, because this is where you will get viruses as a because they're a cleaner. They're a solvent. They help to break down very toxic stuff in the body. So when I was born, I was exposed to vaccines. When I was young as a kid, I was exposed to multiple medications and also amalgam fillings in my mouth. I had eight amalgam fillings in my teeth by the time I was like 14 or 15. Ridiculous. So a big exposure to mercury. So as I'm working on alleviating all of this stuff i was getting large amounts of mercury come out 
And as that comes out, your body's got to do something with it. And if your body's not able to process that effectively, it'll need to actually use a, a bacterial or a viral um, detoxification in order to handle that. So I went through a really quite heavy uh, week or two. It was about a year and a half ago now, two years ago, I think it was, where I had burns under my arms and I had like a, a, a huge sinus infection and things behind my eyes, which I've never had before. And uh, bronchitis, I'm pretty sure I had. I didn't get diagnosed by a doctor, but I'd say it's bronchitis, which is also something I had two or three times when I was young. So the, when as that poison is going in, it'll cause something like bronchitis. Then it'll store in the organs in the brain. Then as you get it out, you're probably going to regress through those symptoms again. So that was me regressing through childhood symptoms of getting heavy metals out of the body. So that is when I did get a viral and a bacterial uh, infection because that's what it does. It helps the body clean out. Yeah. I mean, would you, would you consider that more of um, a virus, more of a, like a cleanse as opposed to like your body? So since I've listened to your work and sort of um, devoured everything that you kind of, um, anytime you've mentioned someone, I've tried to cross-reference that from researching them myself and looking into it myself. So, I mean, um, the work of, of Dr. Uh, you know, Andrew Kaufman, Tom Cowan, Stefan Lanka, the work that they are doing to prove, you know, that essentially kind of what you're saying is like, it wasn't necessarily that like you caught something that was airborne or whatever that we're being told. It's more, it's actually within your body as a toxin to a certain degree. And when you get sick, it's when your body is actually ridding that from your, from your system. Meaning like what you had in you was there for you know years and years and years and actually it's it's interesting like so since i've been when uh following some of your stuff uh, i was looking at I was reading the anshas von der planet's book and stuff like that with the mold berries so i had some of that going um and um doing that and doing some bentonite clay every day and um and actually just finally got hooked with uh, hooked up with some uh, some raw milk finally was able to find some because it's like you know, it's, it's honestly like, it's like heroin in, uh, in Canada. It's, contraband, yeah. <laughs> it's, ins it's actually insane. Um, but, but, you know, since having that, the only difference really was those three things in my diet recently. And I've been trying my absolute best to do everything that I can to follow like a Weston A. Price kind of found, you know, uh, diet, which is just all whole foods, you know, nothing processed and all that kind of stuff. And I ended up getting, I ended up, I would say getting sick, but I, but now I would, I would classify it as uh, my body went through a cleanse. And it was just such an empowerment shift of, oh man, I'm sick. Like I caught something as opposed to, I'm actually taking the steps to knock something loose within my system so that I get through this and actually become healthier and stronger once I'm done this cleanse. And it's just, I think that like, again, what kind of you've opened up a lot of people's eyes to is the idea that, um, you know, with this, and I would say some other stuff, which we'll hopefully get into in the conversation, but it's all the empowerment kind of, um, solutions that people are, that are, are, are kind of like becoming to the forefront of people, which are, these aren't things that are, you know, scary for you and you have to avoid catching. It's more that like, it's actually a detox mechanism within your body to rid yourself from toxins that have previously been stored. Mm. Yeah, totally. Uh, there's a big word in there that you mentioned, which is empowerment. So I'll get to that as well. Cause I love how you, I love that you brought that up. But yeah, it, look, it could be from an acute exposure, acute meaning that you've just, it's just come in. And so in the, within 24 hours, you get, a, you get a reaction, you throw up, you get diarrhea, you have mucus, that's an acute reaction. Then chronic is when it's been long-term, it's been in the body for years. And um, some detoxification cycles can last that long. And when you get the mucus, the cold, the achy body, that's the end result. That's the last stage. But whatever that was, whatever that was that was breaking down could have been breaking down for years. You don't feel it until you get to that end stage. But if you're aware of the subtle goings on, then you might feel it going on for a year or more. You're like, mm, yep, my body's not at its 100% optimum. That means it is undergoing detoxification. And then you'll feel that sickness is the last, last part of it. But you don't necessarily even have to have that because if the detoxification is working well and you are excreting well through the skin, the kidneys, the liver, the, the bladder, the bowel, uh, you won't get that last just dump of everything where it's just, oh, my body, oh, I feel crap. That's, that's like the, 
the end stage of a more severe one. Now, the empowering thing, though, is interesting because I remember saying this to Thanos on a podcast I did with him. I mentioned that I used to be one of those people that we see today and we think, come on, idiots. Those people who wear masks and look at us like we're disease carrying lepers and that we're being irresponsible because we could infect the, the vulnerable and weak, right? But we know that's not the case because how can an asymptomatic individual, a healthy individual infect somebody with anything, right? Even before you find out that you can't catch stuff off other people, you already would think that. But I was one of those people who was immunocompromised and I would be on the bus because I had no money for a car or anything like that. And there would be somebody like coughing up a lung up the front and I would sit there. I wouldn't say anything to them because it's like, what can you say? They're on the bus. What are you going to do? Kick, throw them out the window. But my blood would boil inside me. I would be thinking, how can you, you inconsiderate piece of air? And now I would be boiling inside thinking, you're going to make me sick. I can't afford to be sick. I already get sick too much. And that's the life that I was living. So that is a very victimized way to go through life. And then you find out how this all really goes on and, and your connection to nature and your responsibility. And that leads to empowerment because now you're not, you're not a victim. Like it's your victim over here and you're in the opposite ends of the spectrum, right? So when you lose that victim mentality or that thought process, you become very empowered where you're like, go ahead, get on the bus with a bowler or AIDS or whatever. It doesn't matter. It's because I'm me. I take control over my health. Like I'm the one. And just getting stressed about someone that will create a, a chemical soup in you that will make you sick. It will suppress your immune system. It will make you acidic. It will, you know, it'll do all those things. So it's just a different way because you can look at people now and just, you don't mind, you know, they don't affect you. You have compassion for them instead of anger towards them. And how many people do we see today feeling fear, anger, anxiety, no compassion whatsoever, who look at people who don't wear masks and they think you're going to kill my granny or you're going to kill me. And that's a really disempowered way to go through life. And so uh, this kind of knowledge or education or uh, understanding, whatever you want to call it, at the end of the day, Rob, it's empowering because we just, we lose the fear. Yeah, I'd kind of, I would like to switch gears to, to more empowerment solutions, but I just like, if, if maybe we could hit on like what the best kind of, um, I don't know if argument is the right word, but best kind of information to give to people who might not be, uh, you know, aware of some of the things that we've been talking about here and the actual kind of scientific, um, you know, validation that's really coming out now especially being suppressed with everything like that. But um, if, like the best case uh, for why what we're talking about is actually kind of um, the reality of the situation as opposed to dangerous misinformation and all that kind of stuff. Like, what would you say is the reason why um, you have come to the conclusion that viruses don't exist? Like, how can, how can someone, like you're saying people, you know, viewing uh, people such as ourselves, um, there's no, you know, there's no scientific, of course it is like people are walking around, people are obviously you turn on the TV, people are dying and you know, all these things are happening. The tests are through the roof and there's all these people, you know, what, what do you say to those people to kind of maybe shift their thinking into a different way and what you actually mean by viruses don't exist or aren't as described? It depends on how they're asking. Firstly, if they're genuinely asking, then I can, but if they if their minds are just gone, then they're gone. I just, it's a, it's a different thing, but I'm not sold on the viruses don't exist. They're just not, you just can't catch them. That's the difference, but it's also how you define something. Like I'm playing with an Allen key here, but if you called that a pencil, you'd say Allen keys don't exist, right? It's just how you define something. Hmm. So a lot of people define uh, viruses more as exosomes or as uh, excretions or something. People call them different things. I think that they exist, but one thing is for sure, they're not alive. And you learned that in, well, I learned that in primary school. And that's why doctors don't give antibiotics or anything, at least when, at least when they were relatively good at their jobs. <laughs> they wouldn't give you antibiotics for a virus because it's not alive. You can't kill it. So then... I mean, that, that underpins the catching a virus thing. How can you catch something that's not alive? It doesn't make any sense. So when people talk about, you know, I mean, 
this is one of those things where you, you kind of you asked it in a way that like you, you're given the answer right because you go people turn on the tv to find out people are dying it's like that's <laughs> that's the giveaway it's like if, if you look around in in the real world you don't see people dying you know and look uh there's something around half a million to a million people every year die of the flu every year since you know we started recording uh, at least in the modern times where there's been a lot of uh, environmental pollutants and uh, environmental toxicity so there was something like i think the figure is something like 17,000 per day 17,700 people per day will die of uh will either die of I think it's died of. And then that means 100,000 people will be diagnosed with some kind of upper or lower respiratory tract infection. That's a lot of people on a daily basis will be diagnosed and 17,000 people will die. So 100,000 diagnoses and 17,000 will die because you have to be diagnosed. You have to be sick for a while before you die, right? So then there are certainly people around the world that are dying, but what of? And it's really coming out more and more now obviously it's suppressed in the mainstream media i love jim bob's uh, memes where he says you know the media controls all of the information and and, that, and then the other person goes well that would be on the news if that was true <laughs> yeah it's like it's so funny but anyway for somebody that's not really up on that yet if you take the time to do independent research and actually go looking for numbers and not be fed by the news you'll see that uh, there actually aren't that many people dying. And a lot of the mainstream news reports have had to come and correct some of their previous numbers where they said actually most of those died of comorbidity factors such as heart disease, diabetes, uh, old age, you know, just pneumonia, bacterial infections. And that's what the cause of death was. And now more people, because they're sick of it, they thought it was going to blow over the whole COVID story, but it hasn't. And now it's getting more draconian. So they're coming out now. So you've got yeah. nurse groups that are whistleblowers and they're saying that they were offered. I mean, you, you can find this out yourself as well, that they get offered $25,000 to put something, put a death down as COVID. Families who are offered $16,000 for a funeral to put the death, to sign a death certificate that says it was COVID, not that it was heart disease or diabetes or anything else. So the actual death rate around the world has actually gone down in 2020 than it was in 2019 less deaths worldwide in total so that that tells the story yeah. and then you've got and then you've got the fact that most of them were uh, fudged that to make the covid thing up and then the amount of tests as you said so the testing the only test that is allowed <laughs> it's not blood tests it's not anything other than a pcr which is a polymerase chain reaction and it's not a test if you go and have a look at the guy i forget his name but the guy who actually invented the PCR, he has many interviews stating that it is not a diagnostic tool. So then you have to ask the question, why are we using a tool that is not a diagnostic tool to diagnose people for a supposed disease? And the answer is because what it does is it amplifies a, a signal of some kind and you have to test specifically for it. So what that means is, and you have to run cycles. And if you run more than around 35 cycles, you're almost guaranteed to get a positive result. And that's why people have shown that you can test a goat for, paw, uh, a goat for COVID. You can test a pawpaw for COVID. You could literally test anything, run it at 45 cycles on a polymerase chain reaction, and you'll get a positive, so to speak, result. And, so, and that's also why certain people aren't walking the earth anymore, because they made that publicly known. And now they're not around to keep telling that story. So including, that also tells a story. Yeah, including Kerry Mullis, who invented the test too. Uh, I think it was August That's of 2019. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And I mean, I think it's, you know, I guess I was kind of leaning into that too. I mean, I think it's more or less the, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of categorical error, you know, like, yes, there is something kind of there. There's something going on. Clearly we're seeing something, whether that's a virus or an exosome, which again is the work of like Stefan Lanka and stuff. But the difference is that the way that they try to um, prove contagion is the thing that is flawed in terms of they're not actually isolating the particular, um, I guess, like nuance or something like that, or nuisance, sorry, like the particular thing of which they're saying is this actual adjuvant, the testing of which they're trying to prove the contagion doesn't account for actually using just that adjuvant to prove any sort of disease or breakdown or anything because they're using 
you know, all these crazy control tests. And there's actually a quote that basically says like, you know, at the beginning of the 1950s, when they were using this kind of term, which is using, you know, fetal calf serum or, you know, all their other things that they put in with that and basically states that the actual control, control test from someone who was uninoculated, I think measles was the first one, the control test that was uninoculated from measles using the same way that they were breaking down the tissue, which was not, you know, purifying it and having just that, uh, that kind of virus, um, and then starving it, poisoning, or, uh, uh, putting dye in it and putting all these different things to try to have a, a tissue breakdown was stating that the control test could not be distinguished with confidence from the viruses obtained from measles. You know, it's basically stating that like, it, it's sure something, th there is a, there is some sort of, you know, budding out of a cell or whatever it might be, but the, 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 the idea or the claim that it is the cause of anything is the categorical area, I think is what I'm seeing too. And again, and then I have a PCR test when they haven't been able to isolate that thing. How can you test for something that has never been isolated to prove that? And then again, you also have like, you know, golden, uh, um, you know, uh, like a gold, not ratio, but golden kind of you know, test to kind of like when you're pregnant, right? A sort of a golden, you know, standard is effectively if a baby comes out in nine months, right? There's not really any sort of middle ground there. It's like, is the test working and how, what's the percentage of it actually working? We have a result here, you know, um, yeah. whereas PCR, there's no, there's no gold standard of to go, okay, here's the deviation usually between 10 to 15, whatever it might be. And I would also say that like, if you're actually nervous about, you know, potentially this thing kind of going around and, and people catching and stuff, would that not be interesting to know? Like, wouldn't you want to know what the potential false negative rate is because it's super dangerous that people are out there and what if the false negative rate is 90%? Isn't that, shouldn't that be of interest to people? But again, it's, you know, it kind of leads you into that, but it's people, you know, they're, they're just watching what's on the news and stuff like that. And yeah, you're having people suppressed and all that kind of stuff. And yeah, it kind of leads me into like my next questioning maybe is, is the kind of the more empowerment kind of uh, side of this, which, you know, it's, it's funny, man, like listening to your work and all the, the work of these people, it's kind of like, it's, uh, kind of pulling back the veil of all of this, you know, pulling back the curtain of Oz and kind of going like, man, there is literally nothing to fear. And I don't really have anything, like you said, you know, what you kind of, the conclusions you came to or things that I'm coming to now is like, there's nothing potentially holding me back from anything. You know, if you know that this, this isn't kind of what we're being told, then it's actually something you can't catch. And then the work that you've done to kind of, uh, describe the, the actual law and how that works. It's, it's crazy to think like, I recently went out West to go uh, join a group of uh, Owen Benjamin, like uh, followers and stuff like that, like the bears, they were building a rammed earth house out in BC. And I drove from Ontario to BC to do this thing. And I shot a video for it and stuff like that. And was working out there for like six weeks, traveled all the way across Canada. And like, you know, I mean, we're not apparently as, as nuts as like Victoria at the moment, but um, it's still pretty insane, but you know, no mass, no nothing. And the most I've ever gotten from anyone, has been just where's your mask? Oh, I have an exemption, and then that's it. That's literally the extent of what I'm, what I've, what I've, what I've had. And a lot of that is the the kind of mindset stuff that you talk about too, of like, you know, go into the experience and just kind of have it and see what kind of happens. But it's interesting when you get your mind right and you kind of say like, no, this is just who I am. This is what I'm doing. You carry that kind of thing. Nothing's like I've never actually had to like, you know, put any of these kind of things in place. Um, you know, that you're talking about if you like follow up with the law stuff, but it's just, it's, it's crazy, man, how it's like, it's literally, you can move through this and not actually have any sort of kind of connection to like what you're actually being told on mainstream news, the media or anything like that. It's like, it's, it's, it's very kind of empowering, but it's also kind of confusing. Cause you're like, what the hell, man? Like, <laughs> how do I have any sort of like connection to like, you know, reality if it, if everything is kind of this sort of illusionary state. Yeah, but that's a good thing because when when you realize that, you realize you're not bound to it. So then you can create anything. You can be anything, really. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, like, so one of the things you brought up earlier that I want to kind of touch back to, because this is like a thing that I've kind of had for the past, I don't know, man, like five years, because I, I went to school. Um, I did essentially what people tell you to do. And, um, you know, you hear all these stories, right? About people like, yeah, you know, I wanted to be, I always loved playing guitar. I loved to paint. And it just was, I didn't know how to make ends meet. My parents always wanted me to be, you know, a lawyer, whatever. Um, and now I'm, I'm miserable and 50, whatever. And, you know, 
the story then kind of ends of like, and then I quit my job and now I'm making next to nothing, but I'm super happy and all that stuff. But I did that in terms of what I love with acting and filmmaking. And then through watching what happened to Owen Benjamin and just the kind of political state of, of everything has been ramped up. I think from like, you know, at least when I paid attention to it, like 2016 till now, um, it really threw me for a loop, man. Cause I was like, I don't want to give up my soul and who I actually am and everything that kind of makes me human for this thing. And it knocked me off course of like, what do I do now? You know, like I did what people tell you to do and go pursue that. Um, you know, I can get into kind of like what the realizations and kind of things that I've kind of come, uh, come to realize through this kind of grand awakening with the COVID stuff. But I've kind of noticed that like a lot of people who are okay with what's going on in terms of like they're moving into a different state or they're able to kind of like look at what's happening in reality and not get afraid from that. You know, and some people who do well, by no means, like they will not even look at the other side because, you know, it's like the foundation is there and it's all based on this particular media telling me this and I can't lose that foundation. And I'm just wondering your thoughts on because I've kind of come to the, the, the realization that it's like the people that have looked into the fire, you know, of their soul and kind of said, like, I need to fundamentally kind of change my outlook on things. And I don't care what kind of comes out on the other end of that, but I just can't continue to be in this state. And then they, you know, become that metaphorical Phoenix from the ashes of like, I am not kind of what you said earlier. Like I'm not all of these things that I apparently am. Like I am, I'm just me, you know? And I think people place a lot of, I don't know, uh, weight on their job title, you know, again, like their mortgage, who they, you know, all those kind of things, right? It's like, this is who I am. And I'm just wondering what you think of like the difference between some people who are willing to kind of look at what's happening dead in the eye and kind of move into a new state of being and the people who kind of are like doing everything they possibly can to kind of not address what's actually going on here. Yeah, I, I just put it down to the, the level of empowerment of the individual. The level of empowerment is based on the level of responsibility they're willing to take. And a lot of people want to think that the government can look after them or does or will look after them. And that medicine is the savior. Like medicine is, is God, you know, science is God. And so to, to give up that means having to take the responsibility for themselves. And that's a big step for a lot of people that they're not willing to take. And so some people like me, they might need to be cornered. That's why I think for those people, the world will have to get a lot worse before they will be willing to take that step. So for some of us, we were already there. For others, they were woken up by the current events. And then there's still a lot of people left that are just like, nah, that could not be true. Do you know how many people, Rob, would need to be in on it if it was a big scam? Do you know how many people would need to be in on it? It'd be all of these people and all of those people and when you know it, you go, yeah, that's that group of people that's running the show. It's like the science, media, uh, you know, government, that's all the people that are in on it. They're all part of the same thing. But they're like, what? That's the biggest conspiracy ever. What do you think? And then they go on to other things as well. So they're not really, that's a massive shift for somebody like that to take. I think what, I mean, how that will happen, I'm not sure. But I, I think personally that that is the difference between someone that's willing to look something dead in the eye, somebody that's willing to take responsibility. Like someone who's willing to look at a tiger right in the eye, someone who's like, I know what that is and I know what I am. You know, I'm not going to pretend that I'm king of the jungle. That's king of the jungle right there. But somebody who's not willing to look at the tiger in the eye, somebody that just wants to be like, nah, tigers don't exist. And, uh, you know, you, can, you can't be hurt in society because I believe in Jesus or I believe in the government or I believe, like that's just the level of not being able to take responsibility for what the individual creates from moment to moment i think that's the thing yeah and i think that um again the what you what the content you're putting out in your website and everything like that is i think truly helping a lot of people including myself with actually arming myself with the knowledge of what to kind of do right now and some of the things you constantly keep hitting is what are you wanting to create like it's not enough to oppose what's happening, it's moving towards kind of what you are wanting to call forth. And I'm just curious as to what you're, you talk about this a lot. 
and you have a lot of, um, you know, uh, streams about creativity. And I'd love to kind of get your, um, I guess, your concept of what create uh, creativity is and why it is so important for people. Well, yeah, because I think that when we talk about, well, first of all, why, it's that I don't really care about vaccines. I don't care about um, taxes or go- because that, that's their thing that they've created or they've used us to create. So then I, I kind of don't care about it. I don't give it energy. I'm really only focused on what I'm doing. I don't like getting bogged down in those sorts of things that don't interest me. So the creativity, the element of it that's important is because we are a form of creation itself. So for me, that's just an extension of us being put here. Like, why are we here? I feel it's to create, it's to create in whatever ways that that happens. So to otherwise i feel we're stifling it so if we get put here we get we however you want to think of it god the creator the nature of life universal life force the universe whatever you want to call that like something makes life right so then if we don't continue to create with that and with that life force then it's like it's like cutting yourself off from it like how can you be whole if you're cut off from what put you in the first place and then how can you uh, be honoring that if you're just, just going along with the status quo, you know, on, that, on, a, on a rat wheel? So I did a post on Instagram yesterday, whatever it was, talking about uh, how the connection to that creates movement. And movement means like something that we created. How are we moving? Where are we moving? Of what purpose are we moving with or towards? And the opposite of that, though, is the movement that most people are in constantly, but it's a rat wheel kind of a movement. They're stuck on like a hamster wheel, whatever kind of wheel, (laughs) that they are using a lot of frenetic energy, constantly in motion, but never going anywhere. And that is what it is like to come into this world with this force of creation to be here and then just plug into that matrix, which is a typical word to use for it. And then that, that to be plugged into that means that you're not creating. You're, create, you're, you're literally just always in reactive mode to what's going on. And sometimes, yeah, creation does come through that. And it's important to feel the difference and to know when creativity is coming from a, a pure place, but also where that's going, because it can move you out of it. It really can. But you've got to tap into what that feels like first. So really for me, it's that, it's that connection to what put us here. That's why creativity is important to me. And what about people who, I mean, I, cause I come from the arts as well uh, to begin with, but I mean, people who say like, well, I don't, I don't know. I'm a, I'm whatever. I, I don't have any connection to like what we call the arts or any, any sort of thing, but um, how does one kind of become more in touch with their creative side and um, kind of bring that forth into, into the real world? We all create all the time. It's just whatever brings some joy. So I'm not an artist. I mean, I can play music, but I'm certainly no artist. But I create all the time. I create ideas. I create different ways to do, to give out information. I create music. I'll create things in the garden. Uh, I create, uh, I know, better ways to relate with, it's just, we're always creating. So then it's not about making some flamboyant art piece that you hang on the wall or somebody buys for a million dollars. That's not the creativity because sometimes that is not coming from that place that I'm speaking about. Like somebody that does some epic artwork, but it's for some conservatorium of some like, you know, uh, upper class country club folk. And it's like, it's not from their heart. It's like something that they did to sell for a million dollars or to appease somebody else. There's nothing wrong with that, but it's just, I I would say it's not coming from a pure place of joy and creativity. Whereas if I want to make my own garden bed out in the garden and I'm like, I want to put some rocks around it. What do the rocks do? I don't know. I just like them, but I want to put it there. Why? Well, I just want to, like, it's, it's just, that's what I feel and I'm doing, I'm expressing from myself. So the other way that I describe creativity, Rob is as expression and expression is the other end of the spectrum from repression and we're all in many ways very repressed in our desires, in our joys, in our dreams. We're all repressed to a quite a high degree by the system, by the indoctrination, by the matrix, by our parents and teachers and everything else, 
and our peers even. So then that expression in its pure sense is that pure creativity. And it's not about being a great artist or musician or, or anything else. Even if you're a very analytically minded individual or you, uh, uh, you, know, you just don't think that you have artistic talents, well, that's not what creativity is in its pure sense. It's just an expression. And you can express through mathematics or physics. You can express through language. You can express through uh, being an athlete. You can express through, right, you know, just whatever. You can always express in a pure form and that's the creativity. Yeah, and I think, I mean, there's so many ways you can go into that too because you can use that for, I would say, for a lot of men in today's world too of like just being more creative or more in touch with your actual kind of internal state, admitting when you're, um stressed confused when you don't feel like you're in full control and allowing that you know not having control uh kind of take take over you right and see what kind of comes out of that and and see if there's anything that you can create within that too right there's so many ways to like allow as opposed to force you know totally and that's actually the masculine power in its essence because it is an, a, a giving or a, a penetrating thing which is outward that's the creativity and uh yeah, so I, I love that. Absolutely. And it is powerful. That's the thing. One of the elements that is muted a lot is the sacred feminine and masculine. And the masculine is, uh, well, both are very powerful, but it's just that essence of pure creativity is in a flow of power. Like you said, Robbie, it's not a forced thing at all. And that ease, that flow that it comes with, that's very powerful. It doesn't have to force anything. Yeah, you had a great stream about, um, I, I forget the song, but it was about the river, right? And how, you know, I can do all these things. I can burn down everything. I've, I've you know, I, essentially like the idea is like, I've never been beaten. I've never been whatever. I've climbed the mountains. I, I am the man, but I can't cross that river. And the reason being is that you have, well, maybe you could talk about it. That's called the Humbling River by Pussifer. And it's, yeah. uh, that's what it, exactly that, you know? It's a conquered country crown and throne. You know, I've, I've braved the forest, braved the stone, but I can't cross this river. And so I, uh, it would seem a simple thing to do because the imagery of that is like, I'm conquering mountains and I'm like blasting through battalions of people. I'm burning this and I've conquered it all. And here's this river and I can't cross it. Why? Like what's stopping me crossing that when I can do all of this stuff? Because that force and that destruction is, is actually kind of easy. I remember watching that, movie uh the wrestler with mickey raw and he says being a tough guy it's easy like walking around all tough and like you with your chest out and like nothing can harm you that's easy what's really difficult is to be vulnerable and soft and to, uh, to be open that's really difficult that takes real strength and the river i mean i don't know exactly what uh, it was maynard who's the the lyricist for uh Pussifer, what he was really thinking with it but to me it represents the feminine that soft aspect where we do allow ourselves to be open to go with the flow as opposed to force everything to just go with that power and see where it goes to be vulnerable enough to open to the that is the force of life can that run through us and we'll let it take us where it a higher intelligence is like guiding us and can we let go of that force? No, nah, got to do this, got to get up at this time, got to do that, got to work this many hours to buy this, to do that. To you know, We construct all of this stuff with the ego mind as opposed to letting the force of creativity, the power, I should say, of creativity flow through us and for us to create with it. I think that's a difficult thing for a lot of people. Yeah. And I think that, you know, it just, it, that just brought up imagery of like, even things like people, uh, like women talking about partners and husbands and stuff like that. And all they're like, they're, they're like drowning in the fact that they don't have the connection to their, to, to their partner. Cause he won't open up or he won't, you know, connect emotionally or whatever it might be. And then thinking of like parents and stuff, right. Like as a, as a son and having a dad, it doesn't like, yes, you do want to see those masculine qualities in your father, but you also want him to have that love and compassion for struggles that you're having or having like an actual kind of open mind of, um, of those kind of things too. And it's like, it's not just, yeah, it's not just the, the force. Right. And it's kind of what you're saying about the power too. Like power is a different thing than force. Right. And one of the things I kind of want to shift into too, cause I, I'm kind of uh, mindful of your time here, but, you know, kind of talking about that and how power is, it's interesting, like, especially coming from the arts and stuff like that, if you're wanting to kind of um, understand power dynamics, a lot of the time, um, when you're trying to write or when you're ever, you're 
starting to trying to do those kind of things, you're actually using power. Uh, you're kind of like the other characters are really the things that are um, that are kind of giving off the power of the actual individual. You know, it's how people react to you and how you react in situations and stuff, right? Where um, force is more, you're kind of like directly trying to like, you know, influence people, or whatever. And I think that to go into empowerment kind of uh, ideas here, one of the things that I find fascinating about what you're talking about is like, just go into the experience, right? Like have the power within yourself to not freak out. If, see, if someone asks you to, if you're wearing a mask, or like, do you have, because right now in, in Canada with like the passports and stuff like that too, right? Is like, you know, find the power within just asking simple questions, you know, like, like you've, you've talked about a million times is like what, you, you'll find so much more about yourself if you can keep your composure, especially in like, you know, sort of threatening situations like that. Um, but, you know, I guess what I'm trying to say is like, how can like people use that sort of divine masculine energy in these kind of uh, these ways to really sort of, I guess, find the empowerment in the current climate that we see ourselves in? As in situational or just how? Well, I guess like a lot of, I mean, again, like I was going to, you know, ask you about what's kind of going on in Australia, because we see a lot of kind of stuff on the news. I know, you know, stuff you don't really want to pay attention to, but um, I think people are kind of hitting a breaking point of where they're kind of at with this whole entire conversation of COVID and all that kind of stuff. Right. Um, and you offer a lot of solutions in terms of um, law empowerment and things like that. And what are kind of like things that you would leave with people that um, maybe would enable them to feel more, uh, you know, have more kind of uh, ease than they, than they kind of see maybe the craziness of what's going on. Yeah, I think realistically, the main thing is that connection to self. I mean, once you can get tapped into nature, I mean, I'm like currently looking at the trees and that outside. It's like, there's no COVID in those trees. There's no rampant police. It's just there. So when you can tap more into that, and not into this screen that offers all of this uh, fear and everything, then that's going to bring you back to yourself a lot more strongly. And with that, if you come across anything like that in the real world, because it's more grounded, it'll carry you through that situation much more strongly and with more empowerment, more tapped into that masculinity, because everything in this digital thing medium here will pretty much sever you from it. It's not a, a powerful thing at all or an empowering thing, I should say. So really, if I'm, you know, if I was going to talk to somebody that had, a, was having trouble, was feeling disconnected from themselves, I'd be worried about the world, how can they carry themselves from their masculine self? Um, I guess, you know, we're talking about men here. Well, it's to really just get back to nature as much as possible. Are you getting as much fresh air, sunlight, uh, just time in nature, feet on the ground? Are you getting enough of that? Because that's where it comes from. That's where it begins. From there, how, how connected are you to your purpose? And a lot of people talk about that. They don't know what their purpose is. Well, I don't know. I thought it was to be a firefighter or a teacher. Or, no, that's like your job. That's not your purpose. Your purpose here, what's that? It's something different. So you you find that by asking. And who do you ask? Well, you just ask. You just ask yourself. You ask your higher self. You ask the sky, the trees, the ground. Just ask nature. And then you just say, well, what is it? What's my purpose here? Like there's, I don't know, what, 4 billion men on this earth. Like, why am I here? There's already that many men. Like, what? how do I do anything different? Or what's my unique nature here? Or whatever it is. So you've got to ask that, really. And you sometimes you have to dig for it. Because I don't think you can just sit there with a beer and watch TV and go, what's my purpose? Oh, yeah, there it is. And you just, it's not that easy. And men traditionally need to test themselves. And I think that's been missing. I think a lot of guys have gone a long time through. Yeah, we've all had setbacks and, and all that, but a real test, you know, like being out in the bush for a week and needing to survive with nothing but a, a knife or something, you know, like needing to fight, to make a fire or to kill an animal or to do, to do something, to defend, to live, to, to survive. That's something that a lot of men are missing. And I think it's part of our nature. Being around fire more, I'm not saying go off in the woods tomorrow and leave your wife and kids and see if you can come back. I just mean test, testing. So for somebody who's never surfed before, I don't know, like don't risk your life or well, maybe risk your life, but you know what I mean? Like it's got to be a bit risky, but not don't go and do anything dumb. But, you know, like 
go out on a big day, feel what it's like to be in the ocean with that much power that could easily take your life, but have enough respect for the ocean and enough confidence in yourself and enough ability to relax under pressure. Take up jujitsu, you know, go and get pummeled by people lighter than you, weaker than you, by women, if you're a man who's never done something like that and feel what it's like to be dominated, but in a controlled environment, learn the humility and then learn what it's like to overcome. So then when you start to learn how to uh, get yourself out of sticky situations, like being pinned to the mat by someone better than you and learn how you can actually start to escape that and then start to defend and hold your own and then start to sweep and then start to attack, that's very empowering. But it can't, that empowerment comes from overcoming adversity. So I, I just, I can't stress that highly enough. I think one of the reasons that I've been optimistic a lot through my life is that I would, through running from those things that I wasn't willing to, to uh, visit when I was younger, I would walk home in the rain when people offered me lifts. I was like, no, no, I'll walk a long way. And on the highway with trucks going past me, like, Phew. and then you know, dumb stuff. But at the same time, I'm grateful for those experiences because they, uh, they make you um, hardy. You know, they make you see something like a police lockdown and just go, Phew. you know, like when I was training a lot, I would swim, I would run to the pool, swim four or five Ks, run home before I'd had breakfast. I'd, do, I'd start that at four in the morning. So by the time I'm having breakfast at like seven, I've already done more than most people are going to do that entire day. The day is easy. It doesn't matter what comes, you know, customers are unhappy or this is like, who cares? I've already, I've already been to battle, you know? And I think a man, I think we're getting beyond that paradigm because that's like something that's a bit lower in the frequency. I think of being a, a being that is wanting to ascend for want of a bit of a word, but it's, I feel it's still important. And I think that unless you go through it, I think it will be difficult to reach a higher a, a high frequency unless you have um, done battle, so to speak. Um, and like I say, it's not that can be easily taken to being something violent or bad. And that's not what it means. It means to go into battle with yourself, to be to be uh, willing to face your limitations or what you think your limitations are. Where's your you know where is your limit? How far can you run? Is it ten k's? And then what you got to have a nap? We'll go go a little further. I remember one of our coaches used to tell us. When you think you've gone as far as you can go, you've still got at least double that you can do. That's your mind about to give up. And it's not, your body is actually literally about to give up. So there's, um, anyway, I just, I guess the whole point of that, Rob, is to, is to go into battle with yourself to just to meet yourself. Because when you go into battle with something, you're going to meet it. And so when you do get to meet yourself, I think that's the time when you can begin to overcome. And the more you do that, those deeper layers of fears and of insecurities and of those shadow parts of you that you never get to find otherwise, you, you move through those and you become so much more empowered as a result. Whereas I say, you know, you could be faced with a, a beautiful woman and you're not scared. You could be faced with like some aggressive male and you're not scared. Or you could be a, a, a task at work or the company's about to fold or, you know, there's a new COVID thing in place and you've got to take a, and you're like, none of that phases you because you've been into battle with yourself so many times, overcome so many times that those things are just like, that's just nothing. I'm not even bothered, but not even, that's not even in my awareness anymore because through this empowerment, I'm going here because as a man, I know what I'm creating. I know my purpose and my purpose is to just, it doesn't, like I said, it doesn't have to be anything grandiose. It doesn't have to be your job or anything like that. It's just, I am moving. But you won't get to that place unless you tapped into the thing that put you here in the first place. So can that take time? Yeah, it can. But just having that, um, the intention to get there and to find that is, is just what it takes and be willing to go through the tests the battles and the time that it takes to get to that place where you feel a great purpose. But I tell you, every time that you willingly take a test, you willingly embrace it. You will uh, watch a fire. You'll uh, be under the stars, the moon, the sun. Every time you do that, you get closer. So it's not like you have to wait right till the end till you're like enlightened or whatever you want to call that. It's not, it's like every time you're doing something to stoke that masculinity, to connect to it, is getting closer to that point.
Yeah, I think what I love about what you brought up there too was the idea of like do what scares you and do the things that are challenging to you, you know, and especially with your your kind of personality type too, right? If you're not the kind of guy who usually does X, try to go do that and see what see what kind of comes out, right? Like, you know, I, I've had huge, um, you know, strides kind of taken this past two years, like trying to wrap my head around what's going on and how that kind of connects with my purpose here too. And I feel like I've stumbled upon that and it's scary because it goes, well, what that's going to mean is like, I'm going to have to start doing things like this. And it kind of like, I'm not going to lie, man. Like, yeah, I was kind of nervous, like jumping on here, even though I know you and I've kind of talked to you a couple of times now, but it's like, you know, those ideas. And what I love about you, how you kind of start up your live streams too, of like, you know, being creative, like playing guitar or do something. Right. It's like, and what I love about the Walter Russell's work is like, give, give for re-giving. Don't give to get, just give, you know, so that you just, you're, you're endlessly creative in the world and see what kind of comes out of that, not for any sort of reaction, but just to kind of like, you know, develop as a person. And I think that that's, that's hugely important. And it's stuff that I'm trying to heed right now. And, uh, you know, like it's, uh, it's hugely important. And I think that, you know, I was watching something yesterday and it was kind of a quote came up that was, uh, if you bring forth what is within you, what you bring forth will save you. If you don't bring forth what is within you, what you do not bring forth will destroy you. And I thought that was kind of, you know, you know, really good for kind of like what you kind of just outlined there, right? It's, it's, you know, every choice you have and not making a choice has a consequence, you know, there's consequences for everything and not doing things also have those consequences too, right? And I think, you know, in a lot of ways, we're seeing that with everything that's going on in the world, you know, people are just doing things just because it's their job. And, you know, I have to do this and all that kind of stuff. Like, you know, there's consequences of that. There's consequences to doing things like we're doing, like speaking out and, you know, you might, it might be tough in certain aspects of your life with people who um, are close to you and stuff like that, but you know, you have to kind of do the things that are kind of scary to you to, to kind of grow, you know? Mm. Absolutely. I love that quote. Yeah. I use something similar a lot, but also, you know, that whole thing of not choosing is also the choice, you know, like choosing, not choosing to live every day is that is a choice by default to not live, you know, to really not do it and it will destroy you. And it's a, it's an interesting thing. I love that you brought up that it's scary what you've got to, because when you do find your purpose and to be on purpose is scary because now you're in it mm. because it's easy when you're not on purpose because you're like, yeah, well, you know, this isn't really my purpose. So it doesn't matter if I screw it up or it goes well, or it just doesn't matter. There's no consequence, but when you're on purpose, it's like, oh, this is what I'm meant to be doing. So I've got a, a it's, and it's scary. And that's awesome. That is that feeling of, of putting yourself in a situation where it is a test and, and to embrace that test. And, and that's one of the things that led that verse that I um, created for, I think I created for the website, but it's the life in every breath, beauty in every step, honor every moment, embrace every test. Because it's these tests, especially as a man, that when we embrace them and we don't run from them, we like willingly have that experience, even though it's scary as hell. You're like, oh, this is because, and that's, we all, we all fear that kind of failure, you know, because when we do finally find that thing, it's like, this matters because other things don't matter so much, but this matters. And, and it's like, you feel a bit of like, oh, it's almost like my ancestors are all watching me through my bloodline now. Like, oh, Rob, you, this is what you're supposed to be doing. And everyone's looking on going, what are you going to do with it? What yeah. are you going to do? And you're like, I feel that pressure, but it's so good. It's, it makes you feel alive. Right. And if you're feeling that here, you know, you know, you're alive. So I personally, I think that's an amazing thing and it's something to be embraced and and to go with and whatever you do with it is, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if the podcast works out well or not. It's the fact that you embrace it and you put yourself into it. And by doing that, like you say, you will, that is the, that is the thing that's going to give and to heal. It's not, it'll, uh, it'll just bring forth more life. Yeah. Wicked. All right. Well, let's leave it there. Cause that's a kind of a very empowering kind of uh, place to end it. But um, I, man, I like, there's so many things here. I got like pages and pages of stuff I wanted to kind of go over and, and whatnot, but um, I just find like your, your wealth of knowledge and we didn't get into any law stuff. We didn't get into, you know, a whole lot of uh, other things like that, but you know, I think it's great to kind of really focus on positivity and, and things like that that are happening now. And you know, there's a lot of stuff I was kind of thinking about going into with like even the virus stuff, but it's like at the other day, like, what does that kind of do? Right. Like you're just kind of focusing on one aspect again, like playing into kind of what's ca- kind of happening in the world. And it's like, are we not kind of done with that yet? Like, can we move on from that sort of thing? And I think it's about offering these kind of like solutions and, and really like trying to just put a beacon out there of like, there's more, 
you know, there's more to a lot of this than just kind of like opposing what's going on and what do we want to create? Like what kind of one we want to call forth? Totally. That's the bigger picture, right? That's And the, everything else is a distraction. That's why I don't care about vaccines and passports. And it's like, I don't care about it because that's their thing. That's their world that they have just put there, that matrix thing. And it's like, the more we're focused on how do I still do the thing and not do the, that thing? It's you just, where's your creativity then? Because it's gone into that, like that is a trap. I think I'm not telling anyone's wrong if they're embroiled in it, but I feel for me, if I was to do that, it'd be a trap. Because then I'm like, well, what am I creating as a result? It's not what I'm going to create. I'm like, that's the stimulus. They're providing it. And I'm reacting to that. I don't want to react to somebody else's stimulus. I want to decide what I do with my life. I want to create from my own life. And that comes from me. The stimulus for me needs to be what put me here, not some Muppets with their power games creating some structure of something I don't care about. That's... That's just me. I don't say that everyone else would do the same, but <laughs> yeah, no, I agree. And the one thing I, I do want to say too, which I kind of forgot about what, when you were talking about being on purpose, I think it's so critical too. Cause it's like, it's not like there is so much that you can like brush off with the fact that like, Oh, well, it's not really what I'm doing anyway. So like, there's not really, a, there's not a cost to what I'm doing here because I don't even want to do it. You know what I mean? Same people like, you know, and it's kind of like, um, once you're on purpose, yeah, you, you're really, it's really kind of scary, but it's also kind of like, the interesting thing about it is it's not a career. It's not like what you're kind of, maybe it's a vocation to a certain degree, but that can change the, the, the sort of what it might look yeah. like on the outside of that. Right. And I think a lot of people are thinking like, I am my career. I am what I do for, 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 you know, to make ends meet and all that kind of stuff. And that's why I think they're kind of afraid of what's going on right now, because it, it has so many different implications. Um, but I think what you said is great too. Like, you know, it's not necessarily like, again, we weren't put here to like work nine to five and have a job, right? Like to a certain extent, you have to do that. I, I understand that. But at the same time, like, you know, think about nature, like it's not clocking in or clocking out. It's more like trying to find out what it is. That, how are you providing value? You know? Totally. And look, this, this I feel is my purpose, but it's not what I want to do. You know, like doing interviews and doing live streams and, and I don't like computers and I don't, I mean, I seem to never be lost for words, but I don't like talking that much either. Like what I want to do is be like a farmer and a rock star. That's what I want to be. I want to be on stage playing music that I write. I want to be farming and I'm not doing any of those things. But this is still very rewarding for me because it's currently my purpose. And like you said, it might change, but at the moment I am on purpose. So it's a good thing. It's not my, it's not what I choose. It's just what I've been chosen in some way to do. And I've, taken that i've like gone this is the the offer or the challenge or this is what life's giving you and i'm okay that's the purpose so i'm on that purpose at the moment but it's different to what i would be doing if i had the full choice about what i would do but it's very rewarding so it's uh, that's that's also like just i just wanted to share that because it's from what you just brought up is in the purpose is not necessarily what you choose or what you're yeah it's more you're chosen for it yeah, there's a great, there's a great uh, film, um, Peaceful Warrior. I don't know if you've ever seen that, but there's the main character in that is just a Gaston and attendant. And, you know, the main character just keeps berating him. Like how he's just some like old man, you know, doing all this kind of stuff. Like, who are you kind of thing? And it was just like such simple little quotes. But basically one that really struck me was, you know, there's no higher service. There's no higher purpose than service to others. And um, yeah, I think, you know, just you coming out of whatever kind of, you know, uh, where you were before all of this and you making that one video and now people want to talk to you on the computer all the time kind of thing. But I mean, what you've kind of done with your website, again, TomBarnett.tv. Uh, so it's kind of like, um, it's, it's, a, it's a plethora of knowledge. I highly recommend anybody going over there and watch and just devouring everything that you have. Um, there's so many things I kind of want to talk to you about and hopefully we can do this again where we can dive into maybe some more, law stuff and, and kind of wrapping people's heads around that. Um, Cause I think it's kind of hitting a fever pitch right now with uh, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, kind of supposed um, stipulations kind of going on. But again, man, like the service that you're doing and the kind of like the, the solutions that you're offering and like just different conceptual ways to think about things, I think is the most important thing. Cause like you said, you don't really say, you know, what you should do, what you shouldn't do. It's just the, the way that you kind of um, get the audience to kind of ask the questions themselves I think is great. I just think, you know, like your, your messaging might be a bit better if you weren't like confirmed Illuminati at this point. Um, but I mean, there's not really much you can do about that. If, uh, you know, 
You know what's funny is I'm I'm looking at my thing, my own, like I, because you know how you can see your own self in that, and I've got that thing coming out of my head. Yeah, I've like positioned myself right in the middle, so that must mean something. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know what that means. <laughs> That's so wild, man. I remember like, uh, yeah, I remember you did a live stream and I was like, is this really a, uh, is this really an issue? But anyways, I don't know. The internet's crazy, but. Um, did you, yeah. Rob, did you go to the trouble of writing um, my website backwards on I your. Did. I did, man. It doesn't was... flip, it doesn't flip it on Zoom. Like your shirt says lion. So the way you've wrote, wrote that, it's actually back to front. <laughs> yeah, man. It was actually extremely hard. It looked, I had to do it again because the first, my first take uh, literally looked like a kindergarten did it. No, but, but what I'm saying is that it's actually the wrong way around for me. So when Zoom doesn't flip the image, it's only Instagram and that that flips the image. That, so that actually is, looks backwards. It's backwards? To, to the, yeah. <laughs> Very cool. Very cool to know. Um, all right. Well, <laughs> there's that there. Uh, maybe I'll like um, put that at the beginning of some uh, of the information or something like that. But uh, but yeah, anyways, uh, Tom, <laughs> that's hilarious. I didn't even realize that. Um, okay. So Tom, uh, Tom Barnett TV, uh, heal me dot something dot health. Heal me dot health, uh, which I think is, is fantastic too. Um, again, I'd love to kind of talk to you about um, also about trying to help people um, wrap their heads around working in the private now as opposed to the public. Cause there's a yeah. whole lot kind of uh, issue as well, but um, yeah. yeah we'll like definitely everything. do more chats, you know, heaps of more than happy to come on a few times, be a regular. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be awesome, man. Uh, I'll link everything in the show notes and uh, yeah. Thank you so much for coming on, man. I really hope people enjoy this and uh, we can talk to you again. Cool. Thanks Rob. Awesome. Thanks man.